Hi, everyone, and welcome to a very special, I was going to say talking insomnia episode, because that's usually what these episodes are, but this is going to be almost more like a talking inside episode. But uh, anyway, big, big welcome, Sean. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And for the, I think a lot of the followers uh, of my YouTube channel know you already from your work, but for the 2% who don't, maybe, you know, do a little uh, intro. Who are you? Yeah, yeah. My name is Sean. Um, I... I'm just a normal guy. I ended up uh, falling into an anxiety cycle about 10 years ago, 10, uh, 10 years ago, where uh, I had my first panic attack. Never knew what that was. And uh, it scared me. In fact, it kind of devastated me. Um, after that first panic attack, I started getting multiple panic attacks. Then I started getting very bizarre physical symptoms. And then I got these scary intrusive thoughts. And then I got feelings of disconnection, derealization, depersonalization. And my, my life was spiraling out of control. I had no idea. And every time I went to doctors, they looked, they made sure there was nothing physically wrong. They said you were fine. And then um, I was like, well, what do I do? And they're like, you know, you just have pills. And then um, I was like, okay, well, let me keep trying to figure out what's happening. And it was, I'd never had anything like that. I never like went somewhere and they told me we don't know what's wrong or you're fine. And I'm like, no, things are clearly not fine. Um, so sleep was a huge issue for me. Um, I don't think I slept more than like three hours for like a whole year, at least. Um, it was uh, it was very difficult. I'd wake up with panic attacks specifically, and it was always around the same time. Uh, it, was, it was around like four or five. I'm sure you you experienced that with um, other clients and stuff. And so um, then I tried going into like, you know, the therapy route, and it was a lot of childhood trauma stuff, which didn't really apply to me. I was a little bit confused by all of it went to naturopaths, chiropractors. They told me I had a leaky gut, I had candida, try this supplement instead. And so I went this whole route, just trying to understand what was happening and how to get out. And I struggled for a while. I became agoraphobic, couldn't leave my house. Um, I lost like 45 pounds and my life was just destroyed. And I was a young 20 year old and like I was expecting to have so much potential and I'm just like, how did this happen? And so then I started understanding what was happening. There was a couple of books I read. A lot of it was just me kind of figuring it out on my own. So I made a lot of mistakes and I was able to come out of it. And then I was like, I'm going to forget about this. I'm going to pretend this never happened. I'm just going to go back to living. And uh, I was working, you know, I worked at Apple. I worked at, um, I, I was working in healthcare tech. And uh, I was just like, you know, I think there's a lot of people struggling with this. And uh, I, I just feel like the system isn't really built for problems like these. And so maybe I can go out of my way and see what I can do to help. And especially since I got out, I felt like, I felt like there's almost like a responsibility. If you're able to get out that if other people are struggling, I don't think it's a good idea to look the other way and just be like, I'm fine, keep living. And so I felt like there was a little bit of a moral responsibility there. And so here I am. And now I have a mentorship where I'm guiding people through, uh, through the same thing and getting them back to living and forgetting about me and what their problems are and moving on. So Love it. I mean, you you kind of encapsulate everything we're going to talk about in this super nice bio there. So, so glad um, to have you here. It's going to be so valuable for our audience. And so I think, uh, as we talked about a little bit before, uh, I, I really want to talk about a little bit more about your journey, what really helped you, and then also talk about like how you transitioned to become a, do you call yourself a coach? I would say, yeah, I'm a coach, mentor. It's it's weird. I, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, teacher, coach. something like that. Yeah, we'll teacher, talk about how you, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, very well, well. So first question to you is like, you know, you're 20 something year old, you have your first panic attack. Did, did you did you sort of struggle a little bit with anxiety here and there or it was sort of out of the blue? To me, it was out of the blue. I think I experienced anxiety, but it was never a problem. Right. Like I understood, like sometimes I would like, you know, in, in, in college, I was like in a hip hop dance company. And so I knew I'd feel anxiety before I would like go out and perform. And so it made sense. The problem that happened was, is that I had a panic attack from sitting during my lunch break and doing nothing, right? It was like, okay, if I would have had, I never had a panic attack, but if I had a panic attack in a stressful situation, that would have made sense. But I didn't really struggle, but you know, this came out of the blue. So it was very easy. And then looking back, I think it was also like, I almost didn't want it to be anxiety. So I almost wanted it to be something physically wrong. Because then if it was anxiety, I took it as like a character flaw. Oh, there's something wrong, you know, my care. And I was, I look back at my life and I would think I was, you know, I think I had moments of anxiety, but I think they were healthy and I don't think they ever got in the way. But then this thing that hit me, I think it was a buildup of a few stresses looking back. 
small stressors too. It's not like monumental thing. They were just small stressors, perfect storm. And it's my body was like, Hey, I need to release all this adrenaline. And it totally caught me off guard and I just wasn't expecting it. And, uh, so I would say personally for me, I, I didn't identify with struggling with anxiety. And I think that helped me psychologically come out of it too, because I think if I wasn't identified with being an anxious person, and I think sometimes when people have that identity, they want to hold on to it. And so they don't want to move forward with letting this go and, you know, fixing the problem because it's part of their identity. So I don't think I had that. And I think looking back, that was probably a benefit. Totally. Absolutely here. So there was, you know, in hindsight, you can see there were maybe these small stressors, but, you know, at the point it seemed like kind of a panic attack out of the blue and, uh, like how, how long was it? I am sure you remember it quite clearly. My first panic attack. How long yeah. was it? God, uh, it must've been like a few minutes. It must've been like, and I remember I was in Montreal at the time. And I remember when I got my first panic attack, I got up, I got up out of my seat and I was like, I don't know what to get. And like, in my mind, I was like, oh, I have low blood sugar level or something. And so like, I had some pomegranate in the fridge. So I was like eating pomegranate and it wasn't working. And so I, I went outside. I was like, I need air. Cause I didn't even feel like I could breathe. So I went outside and I think it was like negative 20 degrees, negative 30. Degrees. I didn't have a jacket. I was just like, and it must've lasted like, I, I honestly, it, it must've been just a few minutes, like maybe five, 10 minutes, but it felt like an hour. Absolutely. And it was just, it was just like this rush. And I felt like after that, everything changed. I felt weird after that. Like it wasn't like the panic attack started and ended, which is what I thought afterwards. I felt weird. I knew it. I was like, something is like different and I don't know what it is, but it's different. And so I tried ignoring it. I was like, whatever. But in my mind, I always knew I'm like, you know, I could never run away from this. This could happen anywhere. What if this happens in the car? What happens if this happens in the subway? What happens if this is a place I can't escape? So I knew that in my mind, but I was trying to push it to the side. Absolutely. Then I had my next panic attack. Well, naturally, when you get when you get one, yes, yes, boom, and then that's when I spiraled. That's when I was like, okay, I need to figure this out. Something's wrong, and uh, that yeah, that was really where I spiraled. But I would say well, it was, probably was the second one fairly close in time to the first one, or I think it was honestly maybe like a week away, maybe five days to a week away, and uh, it happened at night. I was again same thing. I was I was watching TV. Uh, with my girlfriend at the time and we just made dinner and I was watching TV and I was eating and I was like, I don't feel right again. And I'm like, what is that feeling? And that's where I just, that's, that's right. My next, and, I, and then I had multiple panic attacks, multiple, 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 multiple. And then I got like a bunch and then, um, yeah. And then, then everything changed. That's when I really started feeling symptoms. And I had these, a lot of intrusive thoughts. Why is this happening? Was it because I ate something? Was it because like I did this and I had the I had the craziest theories in my mind. It's so silly if I was to tell you, like some of the silliest things I thought I had when I was struggling with anxiety, like when I was like experiencing yeah. And I didn't want to accept that it was anxiety. I was like, this is too physical. You know what I mean? This is too physical. And then it started affecting my sleep. I couldn't sleep. And I would, I would be really tired from all the anxiety that I was experiencing. So it was easy for me to fall asleep, but I couldn't stay asleep. I'd wake up and I would have to like get out. I, I felt like I had to get out of bed. And so, um, yeah, and it was just, it, it just kind of spiraled out of control. I lost a lot of weight too. A bunch. Yeah. And, and but just, just because you mentioned it, like the audience is going to be like, what was, so what was the crazy theory? If you can mention one. Oh my God. Oh, you know, I thought this is so silly. So like I, cause I got my panic attack <laughs> the night after hanging out with a few friends and I got brisket. Um, I don't know why I did, but I, I literally thought I may have mad cow disease. <laughs> cause I was like, cause I looked it up and I was like, what is, and like, I, like, like I ate brisket. This is happening. I was like, and I was mad in cow. Canada and like, I mean, nothing wrong with, but I just, I was in a foreign country and I was like, what did I do? This was, I can't believe this happened. And I started researching what prions are and like all these silly things. And yeah, there was, a, and then, you know, as I was struggling, I also believed a lot of other things I thought I had candida and I thought I had leaky gut and I felt like I had to fix the holes in my gut and like uh, uh, silly things looking back you know I thought maybe I had Lyme disease I thought I had some sort of uh, autoimmune condition uh, that was keeping this alive uh, I thought I mean I thought almost anything and everything like it was yeah. oh my goodness and I think you know I will just say this for uh, for everybody who's tuning in here that uh, 
I, I don't want to spend too much time on, time on like kind of you going down the rabbit hole because anyone can go to your channel, Sean, and, and, and learn more about that. Or even uh, here, we, we, we talk a lot about how like you try medications that don't work and you get, yeah. you, know, you try everything and the more you try, the worse it gets, right? So, mm -hmm. so I want to really dig into kind of your understanding now, kind of your hindsight things. And, and there was, I want to start with the specific one, which was you said that at some level, I didn't want it to be anxiety. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you expand on that? Why do you think that was? Because I, there, there was a lot of misconceptions I had about anxiety, which was ironic because I was like a psychology major at my university. And like, you know, I'd read about mental health, mental illness as a form of statistic, but I didn't really understand it. You know what I mean? And so I experienced anxiety and I just wasn't sure why I was experiencing it. I just didn't know why it was happening. And so part of me was, I wanted this to be, See, if it was anxiety in my head, it was like, well, maybe you're just somebody with like a anxiety disorder. And if you have an anxiety disorder, there's no cure for that. And so I didn't want that to be that because then it was like, well, this is who I am. And I felt like I was a victim to it rather than I was causing it. And I always had the psychological thing, well, if it's anxiety disorder, you're causing it. Um, none of this was rational. And I don't think any of this was conscious yeah i don't think i consciously made that decision but looking back i think there were some inner beliefs there where i was like but you know if it was something physical that's not your fault right that's physical that's not you and then there's something to do you know then you know exactly what to tackle you fix this problem and then you're good and uh you know there's always this fear of what if this is something i'm always gonna have to manage with this is always something that's never gonna go away um this is always something i'm gonna have to deal with and I, I remember one thing very clearly, which was there was no way I could deal with this. It was just too overwhelming. It was too stressful. I wasn't able to function, I felt. And so I was like, you know, so there was a lot of unknowns and there was a lot of fear. Yeah. And there was a lot of misconceptions around it that kept it alive. And if somebody would have just explained that to me, <laughs> what, yeah. what it was, what was honestly yeah. happening, that would have made so much more sense. I have to ask you this one real quick which is, I, I remember from med school, which is like like 20 years ago, the little education we got into like mental health, let's say, was mm -hmm. sort of like we were taught that depression is a condition. And for some reason, they pointed out that this is chronic. It never goes away. Yeah. And like, in, and I, I just took that for a fact. Okay, well, that's too bad. But now in retrospect, I'm like, that's so insane that they teach it that way because it's obviously not true. And I was wondering, like, did you, were you taught something similar to that about anxiety that is chronic and it never, something like that? Exactly. Exactly. I thought that it was a chronic thing. It was a chronic condition that you could just manage and cope with. And that was terrifying for me. Yeah, totally. And I, I still feel like that is the narrative, the, the common narrative. And I, I realized very quickly that doctors, not very quickly, this took me some time to learn, which was doctors, they're very good when it comes to any physiological like physical, like materialist kind of thing. So they look at it like in terms of a microscope, but anxiety and these other things, they're, they're outside that scope. It doesn't fit the same frame. So doctors, it's kind of like nutrition, right? Doctors learn a little bit, but you would, they're not nutritionists, right? Like they're, they're more from disease and pathology. And so if you're looking at it from that frame, you kind of miss the whole picture of how anxiety works. Um, and so that, that's really what I would say in terms of, um, yeah, I thought it was, I was told it was chronic. I was fearing it was chronic. And I think the way doctors study anxiety is they look at it from a, like a chemical perspective, but they don't, but there's more to anxiety than just chemical reactions, right? There's thoughts involved, realities involved. There's a lot of subjective experiences that you can't look at. And so it, you know, doctors kind of have a limited view. And I think doctors have a huge part in the recovery journey in the sense to make sure there's nothing physically wrong, um, which is a big part, right? Because there are certain conditions that could cause anxiety. But once you get that ruled out, I think doctors' ability to help gets very limited after that. Yeah, 100% agree. And I, I, I this, I'm seeing like this could be a whole other like one hour podcast discussion on how like the Western kind of you know, approach to the scientific approach is helpful in so many ways that it, it, I guess it just became natural to say, okay, now we have this other thing called anxiety and now we're going to approach it the same way, study it, measure it, monitor it, blah, 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 which is not helpful in my opinion. But uh, let, let's go back to, uh, I, th I think a topic that may be more helpful for 
the community here, which is uh, just a little bit on like, like where things turn for you, where the kind mm -hmm. of key insights, key moments, when did things start to become more clear for you? So I struggled for a while and this was ironically on my birthday. All right, this is actually on my birthday. So I woke up with a bit of a panic attack and my diaphragm was very tightened. I just felt it. And I like went to my mom downstairs and it was like eight o'clock in the morning and my mom's like, happy birthday, Sean. And I was like, I was living at home at the time. I ended up moving back home and I, I wasn't even working, by the way. I wasn't working because I couldn't. And um, I was like, mom, I'm not feeling good. Can we go to the ER? My mom, you know, being a concerned mom, she was like, oh, I don't want him to feel any discomfort. Let me take him. And so I went to the ER and my dad was against it. My dad was like, this guy, like he's, there's nothing wrong. Why are we gonna, you know? And I didn't have health insurance at the time. Uh, so I knew it was gonna be, he knew it was gonna be very expensive for me. And I got this young doctor, this ER doctor, super young. He looks at me and he's like, you don't look very sick. And I, and I was very mad because I felt like I, I've been constantly felt neglected. And he was like, nah, you're fine. Like I have actual people that need to be in the ER right now and you're taking up that space. And I was like, no, what I'm going through is legitimate. And I've been Google searching. And I've been doing all these things. And he's like, you know what, whatever test you want, we'll do it. Whatever test and you name them, we'll make them happen. So I thought I had this and I thought I had that. And I thought, and then like back to back to back. And literally every test came out negative, every test. And then I didn't have anything to say. <laughs> and then he was like, okay, anything else? And I'm like, so you're telling me really this is nothing physical, even though I feel so physical. He's like, exactly. He's like, you're feeling it, but it's not physical. And then I was, and then, then it came to my mind, oh, wait, is this how anxiety works? Did I just have the wrong perception of how anxiety works this whole time? Maybe anxiety does. And what you said earlier, I don't like the Western approach. And I think the way I was also taught too in school, which is there's the mind and there's a body and there's a separation. Right. And you study the body and the tools that you use to study the body, people try to apply in the mind. It doesn't work that way. But I realized at that point, there's really no separation. I realized that connection that we had was never. And then, you know, I learned a lot about mind body connection just from my research of struggling with anxiety. And I was like, oh, there's no connect. Like there's no disconnect. That's where I think I wasn't my recovery journey changed because, and I, and my recovery journey started because for the first time I was actually receptive to the fact that, oh, okay, this is anxiety. This is how anxiety works. And I tried so many things before that hadn't worked that I was like, oh, okay, okay, maybe I do understand. And so then after that, I read a couple of books. One book was from a, a, um, a doctor by the name of Claire Week. She passed away. She wrote a book in like 60s. I don't even know if it was legit or not. And she talks about it and she described it in such a way that like exactly what I was going through. There was this other guy too, Paul David, who's always like, you never see his face. You don't know anything about him. I didn't know if he was legitimate or not either. He had a blog. I wrote his, I read his book. That was it though. I would just had those two resources. And then um, I had some family support and I just had to figure it out on my own, but I knew fighting it, fixing it, analyzing it, trying to think it through. These things were not helping. And I had to go for a different approach. Um, and yeah, I mean, I made a ton of mistakes, but I would say that's when my recovery journey started. That's not where I got better. That's where I started. But, you know, that really led me to where I'm at right now. Wow, such a power powerful story. And I think, uh, I think for, again, I'm thinking about like, what's the most helpful for the community? I think it is probably talking more about like kind of what happened next, meaning you, you know, things get easier and, I, I, in my words, to summarize it, I would, just, I would, I would imagine it's because you kind of did the opposite of what you had been doing, kind of less, less, less attempting to fix it, less intervention, kind of letting things be, uh, and things kind of calm down like that, right? It, it is just for a quick summary. Would, would you say that's sort of true? Yeah, and I think with your audience, you you focus a lot on sleep, right? And like it's kind of the same thing. It's like when you try to. I always give the example that like, if you're like, I'm going to sleep at this exact time and I'm going to make sure I'm in bed and I'm going to make sure there's no sound. And like when you're that uptight and you're that focused, sleep doesn't happen. Sleep happens when you let go. Exactly. Right. And it was the same thing with this. I had to learn to let go, but I was so scared of holding on because what if this happens? What if that happens? And a lot of that was fueled by ignorance of how anxiety worked. I thought if I got dizzy, what if I do actually pass out? I feel like I'm going to pass out though. No, that's legitimate. No, but you won't. But no, I feel it. You don't know how I feel. But if but then I learned you can't follow your feelings. 
And so I learned it was like a whole different paradigm in, in this recovery journey. And I think we're so psychologically focused on, okay, here's the problem. I need to intellectually fix the problem. Yes. But problems like these, you can't, it's like, it's like a hammer, right? If you're, but like, you're going to assume everything's a nail and this is not a nail. Exactly. If you keep trying to hammer it and like nail, you'll, you'll break the whole house down. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know? And so yeah. that was a whole, that was like, okay, it's a whole different approach. And then I had to learn certain things along the way, certain personality things that I had along the way that fueled this, that I had to let go and unlearn. But it was, it was an incredible journey. You know, looking back, it was, I don't think I'd ever had so much growth in my life in such a short amount of time. And it was very fulfilling. Looking back, it was, it really is a blessing. I know at the time, the audience members are going to be like, this is terrible. But you know, once you're looking back, I mean, I don't think I I've, when we have people recover and they talk about it too, I don't think anybody says, everybody says unanimously, like they're glad they went through this. They're yeah. glad they came out and, you know. And we have the exact same thing within that sort of like insomnia community, like exact mm -hmm. same thing, the same learning and people say like insomnia was a gift to me. And then I know exactly like somebody who's hearing this for the, like new to the channel will be like going to slap me, but yeah. <laughs> exactly what we hear all the time. And, and I, I had this question for you, but you've already answered it, which was, you know, when you, when you learn, learn, um, read Claire Weeks, mm -hmm. you know, she has this amazing understanding of anxiety, but what's, what's kind of shocked me with her teaching is that she still goes to say like, but make sure you sleep eight hours or something like that. It's like, she doesn't yeah. really have that understanding, right? No, that's true. Yeah, there were gaps there too, I found. Yeah, because especially when, see, everybody, I feel like anxiety suffers, they have their own biggest symptoms. Sometimes for some people, it's dizziness. Some people, it's nausea. Some people, it's the depersonalization, derealization. Some people, it's sleep. Now, with people that are asleep, they're more uptight about the sleep. And so in that case, you know, Claire Weeks, you know, she, she would talk about sleep medication. She'd call them tranquilizers back then. You know, these are not terms we use anymore. And so, yeah, there was some moments that I think, yeah, there were some gaps because what for an anxiety sufferer, what that could mean is, oh, look, Claire Weeks says I have to sleep eight hours. And so it reinforces that idea of I need to sleep. I need to sleep. But they've been doing that and that doesn't work. Yeah. And so I, I, with those clients, I use, I'm like, look, if you don't sleep, it's not a big deal. Like, it's totally cool. Like, I, I have to dumb it down for them. I have to say, look, it's not a big deal. Like, you're, you're going to be just fine. If you can't sleep today, you'll sleep tomorrow. If you don't sleep tomorrow, you'll sleep the day after. But it's cool. No matter what happens. Um, it's so ironic, you know. Um, I used to, when I was a kid, I used to go to India. And I used to see, like, driving in India is really rough. It's hard. Like, it's terrifying. And I remember I would see, like, kids, like, on bikes, like, their parents driving. And they'd be sandwiched between, like their whole family would be on one scooter. And I would sometimes see kids falling asleep and almost like falling off. And it would be scary for me, terrifying. And then sometimes I would also be, we, I once went on a train ride and sometimes there's not enough room inside the train. So people are on top of the train. And I saw people falling asleep there too. And I remember when I wasn't able to sleep, I was in my room that was perfectly air conditioned that had a great mattress. And I was so envious. I was like, how do these guys fall asleep? And I'm in the most comfortable spot and I can't fall asleep. And the part of it was, I was just too hammered into sleeping. I was just like, I want to like, you know, I, I just didn't let go. And, yeah. you know, with those people, they just, it was natural for them to let go. And so even in dangerous situations like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. That's, that's such, such amazing examples. And you know, in my, like, when I hear this, I'm like, you know, I, I always, con I contextualize insomnia as like, you become afraid of not sleeping. Like the fear of being awake actually keeps you right. Yeah. And so, and, and the bizarre thing is that when there's an actual real risk of, of harm, when you're about to fall asleep, sometimes we fall asleep easily. Like for me, it's like when I'm driving and I'm like, yeah. how can I be falling asleep now? I know that this is dangerous. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. It's, right. It's, it's, right. Yeah. Um, but anyway, my, my question to you was going to be like, um, do, do you see that, like, or do you see insomnia as just another manifestation of fear or anxiety, which you so clearly do, but it really I, I would is, say, yeah, I would say, or, yeah, I mean, and it wouldn't have to be under the anxiety umbrella. I guess the terms are really hard to define, right? I define anxiety, anxiety is just like your nervous system is very sensitized and you've developed this habit of overthinking it where you're getting in the way of things. Um, so yes, I would say in that sense, for sure. 
Yeah. And some, no, look, I think there's some legitimacy sometimes when there's a stressor that's in the moment, right? Like if you have like a, you know, a major stressor, you don't get a few nights rest. That makes sense. That's understandable. Yeah. And sometimes that's what kicks starts the problem um, where they have the stress, they begin overthinking and now they overthink everything, including the sleep. And now they have a new problem, even though the old problem gets resolved. Right. And so like, I think it's, it's the same process um, where it's just, there's a lot of overthinking and you're trying to think your way into something because you're too identified with these things, not knowing that, you know. Yes. And it, it kind of shifts the focus like, okay, now I don't, now I sleep fine, but now I have this derealization. Right. And then that you see that a lot, I'm sure like it jumps, the focus jumps from one to the other, but it's in the, in the bottom is sort of the same thing. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think in the body is still the same thing. Yeah. And you already answered, like, I was going to ask you that, like, you kind of like, what is your framework? How would you explain anxiety? And I, I think, is it, I mean, you, you call your, or actually let's just pause there. Let me pause there and just go towards what I wanted to go, which was um, this, I, 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 it sounds to me like this idea of like maybe helping other people who, who are in this, in this hole was always there, but what made you kind of transition and how, what was that transition like to becoming like a, a mentor or a coach or a teacher? Yeah. Um, you know, once I came out of this, I learned even before I started doing this, that I did want to improve quality of life because I was looking at, it, I was like, you know, what can I do to improve quality of life? And so I actually originally went into, okay, what are some of the biggest things that I think are going to be in the future that is going to be part of my generation? And I felt like technology was a big part. And so I really wanted to leverage technology. And so I worked at some really great companies. I learned a lot. I learned a lot from them. Um, and then I said, you know what, I want to focus on health because I learned, I learned from going through this, that if, if you don't have the foundation of health, everything crumbles, everything crumbles around you. And so then I went the medical route and, uh, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't fulfilling to me personally, because just because there, there was a lot of things, there was a lot of discussions that had nothing to do with the patient. It had to do with regulatory things, you know, liabilities and, governance and all these things that wasn't the best. And, and I also felt like in terms of technology, which is where I was at, it's uh, in, in healthcare, it's just a Frankenstein. It's just with all these things with HIPAA and everything, you just stifle. It, it's just, it's so weird. It's so bizarre and it makes no sense. Um, and then I was in Italy with my family because I'd worked really hard on this major project and I finally had a vacation and I was in Italy and Maybe this was kind of serendipitous, but I wasn't able to sleep that night. And I normally can sleep really well. I can sleep really well. And I wasn't, I wasn't able to not sleep because I was like scared of it. I was honestly thinking, I'm like, what do I want to do? And I think I just turned 30. And I was like, look, man, like, you know, if you want to make a risk, you should do it now. And so I was like, well, what do I want to do? And I said, you know what? Ideally, if I could do anything, it would actually be this. And then I said, okay, well, how would you do that? Because do you want to go to, you know, do you want to be a therapist? And the answer was no. So then I was like, you know, I could leverage the internet. I could, you know, because there's a lot of things that have changed. Instead of trying to be a generalist, why don't I focus on one specific problem? One, be really good at that. And then the world is there, right? I don't have to work with somebody in Austin. I could work with somebody in Australia. Like, you know, I could have a chat with somebody from, you know, Oregon or wherever. And like, I can help anybody. And I can really focus on not just doing sessions to make them like per session, but I want to see results. If I'm going to be spending time with people, I better be getting some results. And so I was like, you know, why don't I work with people an extended period of time? I don't need a lot of people. Just need a good amount. Let me show them. And I literally came back from Italy. And that day I tried to work a little bit and then put in my two week notice. I gave him my two week notice, like <laughs> the first two hours I was there. I was like, listen, I, I, I can't do this. And I just, I quit. I had like a little bit of savings. I knew I had to make some sacrifices. I knew I was going to move back home. I knew I was going to like give up my social life uh, to do this. And uh, I didn't know if it was going to work. That was the scariest part. I didn't know if it was going to work, but I think learning from anxiety is like, I'm not as risk averse from uncertainty, you know? And I think that's what a lot of anxiety suffers and a lot of insomnia suffers deal with, which is the risk of uncertainty. And I think going through this, it made me comfortable being uncertain. Yeah. And I said, I would just, you know, do it. And I think that was a huge part of why I was able to do it. And so I did it and, you know, it was a lot of work and, but it's very fulfilling, you know, and it's, you know, so yeah, that's really how I decided to do it.
That's amazing. And I, I just quickly want to sneak in this one, which I, I wanted to bring up when we were talking, which was that, you know, there's so much happening right now in technology with like with crypto, which we talked briefly about, and there's so much changes that are amazing. And, and as a culture, I think we, we really look up to people like, you know, Steve Jobs and like you know, Bill mm -hmm. Gates and like people who made a real big difference in those, in those areas, which I mean, nothing wrong with that, but ultimately like it doesn't matter how wealthy we become or how 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 kind of how much we amass things as a, as a as a as a planet if we don't have peace of mind we can't enjoy it right so it feels like this work is really important isn't it I, I definitely agree yeah if you don't have that peace of mind none of this you know this this builds you know I always say like greater connectivity doesn't mean greater connection not just with other people but also like your own peace and well being. And I think one of the things, you know, we mentioned Claire Weeks, what I really, why I, I look at it and I was like, why was I able to resonate with her? Why was it that she told me the same thing that a lot of the doctors did, but I really stuck with this and it was relatability. And there was a humanity in the way she talked to you. And I feel like sometimes in healthcare and even in technology, people try to use that as a substitute for the humanity. You know, and, and people ask me, you know, like, what was your morality to do this? I was like, there's no morality. It was my humanity. I went through this. It was suffering for me. I know it's just as real for somebody else. And so I look at it as, you know, technology is really powerful, and, but it needs to be leveraged correctly. And it could do just as much harm, right? Because I think a lot of the biggest issues that I deal with is, Technology has allowed me to connect with people all over the world and help them, but technology has also created a lot of misinformation around me that I have to like stifle through and like, you know, break through. And so it's like a double edged sword. And so, um, you know, in that sense, I, I think like using technology, I think in an ethical way where it improves quality of life and it doesn't substitute certain things. It just is there to enhance things. Um, but it also, you know, it's like the mind, you know, I always say like the mind, you know, this gets a little bit advanced and maybe you and I could talk about this, but like, I, and it may not be super, uh, it may not resonate with, you know, even my clients right now, but a lot of this is, you know, the intellect, the intelligence kind of going against you, yeah. you know? And so a lot of times people have to learn how to use that intelligence. It's like a, it's like a tool. And if you don't know how to use it, you'll hurt yourself and, you know, you'll cause more harm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I, see and, uh, I think technology is the same too. I think technology is another layer of that. And now um, uh, when you came back from Italy, what was kind of your vision and, and how did it materialize? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> um, I didn't really have high expectations for it, to be honest with you. Um, I, I didn't think it was going to work, actually. Um, I looked at it as, <laughs> and this is so funny, I didn't think there was a lot of people that had gone through what I went through really yeah it's really silly now looking back uh but at the time i just didn't know i was like how many people in the world were going through this and i was like maybe a hundred <laughs> <laughs> and then i was i learned really quickly that was not the case um so for me the thing was are like if i'm if i'm helping people will there be people to help because even though i'd gotten better i still hadn't met anybody quote unquote that had gone through this so my expectations were pretty low. And I was like, you know, um, I'm just gonna try. I'm gonna see what I can do. And um, I, I was literally like, if I can work with one person a month, that, that was fine. I literally like broke down my uh, numbers, like bare minimum for me to live, um, for me to live and I have a dog. So I was like, <laughs> how much does she need to live? Maybe I can give her daycare once in a while, but like, and like, and I was planning on moving back home and I was planning on staying home. And so I wasn't expecting it to blow up this way. You were going to go like ramen slash dog food profitable. I was like, wait, well, if that's what it takes, you know, it's like, you know, we'll see how it goes and we'll see if it's worth it. And um, yeah, I, 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 you know, it was, it was interesting. I hadn't really seen anybody do it successfully before. And I wish somebody did because then I would have known this was repeatable. Yes but I didn't see anybody. And so I really was like, okay, I'm like the first person, right? <laughs> because I'd seen other people try, but they hadn't succeeded. And I felt like I knew why. And, and, I and felt like that. Sorry to jump in, Sean, but uh, when you say like to try it, was it 
you know, was the idea like, I'm going to try, I'm going to create a YouTube channel where I'm going to teach and then some, and I'm going to get some private clients and I'm going to teach them by Zoom. Was that kind of the idea or what was? It wasn't even that far. It was like, can I show people how to overcome this, not just cope or manage? Because I felt some people would try to talk about that, but then it wouldn't get that much traction and they'd go back to coping. Hey, have you tried this breathing technique? Have you yeah. tried this? Have you tried yeah, that? Exactly. And even now that's still, you know, 100%. massive. And so that's why I was like, I'm coming from a whole different approach and I'm only talking about this. I'm not talking about any coping crutches. And so in that case, it was scary. Um, I hadn't even came to the conclusion that I was going to create a YouTube channel. I was literally writing blogs. I was like writing, I was on forums and I was like, like making posts. I had no idea I was going to be on video. I didn't know what a thumbnail was. I didn't know what any of those things were. So that was so far down the line. Um, yeah, but that, that was really it. And Got so, it. so you kind of connected with people one-on-one -on -one and you started teaching people and then you saw that, oh, this, this is working. You, you must, at some point you must've seen like, oh, this is, this is really working. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. It was really good. And it was also for me at the time to test trial too, because I wanted to make sure I really did believe this was the way. Um, but the more I've done it, the more solid my foundation has become on it. Because sometimes I was like, but what if it only worked for you and not somebody else? And so I would be working with people one-on-one. -on -one. This was back in the day, a couple of years ago. Yeah, sorry, so, roughly how many, how many years ago was this? I started this like less than three years ago now. Back in the day. <laughs> so like back in the day, <laughs> it was like maybe like, um, and so I was dealing with a lot of one-on-ones. And then one of the things I learned very quickly was I was answering the same questions from different people. And so then we shifted it to group. And I was concerned about moving it to group because I was like, well, the inner connection, you lose that, right? But what I found was the opposite. I found like people being in different stages and the community aspect really broke the stigma around it. And then it was really easy to know that you're not the only person going through it. That instilled a lot of trust. And oftentimes when I'd have to answer a question, I can answer five people's question in one take. And uh, so it helped me help more people, but it also didn't reduce, I think the quality of getting people results. So that was the biggest thing. I think I think it's actually easier now, like now that we move group than it was one-on-one -on -one. because they were like, oh, you've gone through it, but how do I know? Like, and I'm like, listen, I had like 20 other people I just talked to before. They all went to the exact same <laughs> thing. <laughs> and I'm like, look, look here, meet them. And then like, that's where we did the group. And then that's where things went off. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful, wonderful to hear the story. And uh, so many parallels that I could comment on, but I will just say there are so many parallels. I, I recognize so many things. And, and I want to ask you this. So at this point in, in time, you know, I, I listened to one of your, what I call success stories, which is like, you know, you talk to somebody who's doing well uh, and you, men, you, you, she was, I think, I think she was from the Philippines and you said, oh, I think you were probably on so-and-so's calls because of your time zone. So now you have some like moderates or some people that work with you. Yeah. Yeah. So now like, it's not like just me, it's like my whole coaching team. And so a lot of the coaches were my clients. Um, and now they've like, it's weird. And I'm sure you experienced this too, right? When people get better, they feel like they want to help others, yeah. right? There's a lot of them that want to help. And there's like this ambition. There's almost like this glorification around being a coach. Um, and so, um, or a healer. And so, yeah, we have a team and we do like multiple, we do like five calls a week and it's all around the world. Cause we have people in Australia and New Zealand. And so we have timings multiple times. So we've really looked at it as we don't focus on sessions. We focus more on results. And so if we need to meet with people as many times, that's fine. That's totally okay. The biggest thing is that like they're focused on their steps and they're, they're making progress. Um, so the person that she was referring to, I think it was this girl named Kaylee. And yeah, she, she had her anxiety experience too. She was able to recover. Ironically, it's always the same method in some way. It's the same principles. Maybe they heard it from somebody else or they got guided by somebody else, but the overarching like principles. And I think that's why you and I connected. I think, yeah. you know, we, fundamentally, I think we're saying the same thing. Um, and so, yeah, and it's, it's amazing. It's incredible. And you know, what's, and you know what's ironic? A lot of our clients are doctors. They are psychiatrists. They are psychologists. And like they are in the medical profession. And so like, it's very like, I think we're, we're shifting to a new era of healing. Um, that's very, very profound, I think. And it's very exciting. Again, never would have expected that to happen ever. Um, but you know, it's, it's nuts.
Oh, it's, it's wonderful. So I think, uh, you know, I know you have to go. I'm keeping it. Uh, oh, no, don't worry, don't worry. Design, I got time. But, I got time. Uh, <laughs> but we have a little time. So uh, first, uh, just quickly, uh, Bye Bye Panic, that's the name of the program, right? That's the name of the program, yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. And um, I wanted to, yeah, two things quickly. Um, one was, uh, you mentioned this is, you know, how, how this conversation came about. Well, it was, yeah, as you said, it was a, a, a follower or maybe it was a client. Uh, maybe like two years ago or a year and a half ago, I said like, oh, you should, you should listen to Sean. Um, mm-hmm. You know, his stuff is really good. And I did. And I was like, yeah, this is very similar to what I'm saying. But then it kind of, you know, escaped my mind. Didn't think more about it. Then yeah. like, I would say like six weeks ago, you, you know, you get these like messages from YouTube, like emails, like how's your channel doing, how you can grow, whatever. <laughs> Usually I don't pay much attention to it, but I clicked and it said like collaboration is really important. Then I was like, who can I collaborate? There's almost nobody out there. And I was like, oh, Sean, I can, <laughs> Sean, Sean is great. So that's, yeah. So, so I'm trying to focus more on that too. I, so I that, don't do, I don't do collaborations. I never do, but I made 2020. I was like, that's why I was like, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> Cause yeah, I haven't been very, very good about that. Um, and and let, let me ask you about that real quickly, because for me, yes, I find it hard because as you said, almost everybody to some degree has that like, but you can also try the hormone. You can also try the pill. It's, it's hard to find somebody who doesn't teach on that at all. doesn't include that at all. I, that's exactly what I was about to ask you. Like, how do you, cause like there's people in the space where, and my biggest worry is, is that like, if I do collaborate with somebody, I almost like feel responsible for everything that person says. 100%. And I'm like, listen, like we collaborated, but <laughs> I don't really agree with this one thing, you know? So I'm trying to figure out that balance too. And it's one of the reasons why I didn't do it. I was like, look, I'll just do it myself. I'll create my own content. To me, it's a game of relevance anyway. Who's the most relevant they win. Um, in terms of like, you know, who, who, you know, like helping people is just whoever's the most relevant, but now shifting to that, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I feel like I've realized I I have to be like, I have to like move the space together. And so like for that, um, yeah, I honestly don't know the answer to that. (laughs) I'm I'm trying to figure it out. Um, It's very easy to connect with people like you um, and like, you know, talk about these things, but what happens when, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a, coping stuff that's discussed and uh what that means so i honestly don't know it becomes it becomes really tricky I, i've been on like this uh, like a podcast episode and it becomes very bizarre anyway i'm not going to talk more about that <laughs> yeah because yeah. it's like do you co- do you interrupt them and tell exactly, them exactly exactly stay quiet and then you're like complicit in it like exactly yeah <laughs> the same feeling and but but um for the last few minutes we have together here this time maybe maybe we'll talk again soon but I really want to spend a few minutes here on like the big vision, which which uh, you already brought up here, which is like you said, there is this kind of profound change happening. And the way I see it is that, you know, you know, the way we have approached things up until now, right? We have psychiatrists who prescribe medications. We have psychologists who aren't actually trained in like a way that often makes sense. I mean, there are fantastic psychology and counselors out there, but they're clearly what we have done so far hasn't really been working. In fact, I think probably there are more and more people experiencing anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, et cetera, right? Yeah. So the way I see it is like things like your initiative, this initiative, where you almost do this peer-to-peer thing, you keep people who've gone through it themselves and become coaches and teachers. I think that will almost maybe replace the kind of old ways or something like that. But how do you say, see the big picture? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think there's a huge gap. There's always been a huge gap. And what we're trying to do is fill that gap. Now, like, and what we, what I think about is like providing a 360 solution for the person going through it. Um, there's its own challenges there though. Um, like, you know, um, one of the things is, yeah, I do see this space growing more um, and really filling that need because it's exactly what I would have needed. If I just had this space that would have explained this, that's, you know, I think with healthcare, it's so fragmented so subspecialized that something as holistic as this, it just, it just doesn't fit in as a puzzle. So I see this space growing. I don't see it overtaking. Um, I don't see it overtaking it. I think what it would do um, was, I feel like it would take off some of the burden from a lot of the doctors that you know, actually have patients that are actually dealing with medical issues. Um, and um, it, it becomes complementary to those things. 
Um, the biggest fear for me, though, is, you know, like in a certain de degree, like, you know, in this space, it is almost like the Wild West, too. Right. Like intentions are great, but execution is a problem, too. What happens if somebody is optimistic but may not be as competent? And, you know, in healthcare, you know, they have different things to protect from that. Um, and like the barrier of entry of this is pretty low. And so I'm curious about that. How I try to look at it is like, this is silly, but I would just be like, let's just dominate it. Like, so they, <laughs> you know, and like, let's just dominate it. Let's just help. And, uh, but yeah, I, I, I see the space growing. Um, I used to think maybe it was the doctors that would be the healers in the future, but I'm starting to see that's not the case. It's people that have gone through it that share their story because there's a relatability element to it. There's a connection element to it yeah. besides the healing journey on top of that. Um, so I just see it with, I, that's how I see it. And I think this could have been done without the internet. So like, this is yeah. still a phenomenon that like happened because of the connectivity that we have. 100%. And uh, it just doesn't, I mean, last word here for me uh, is that, yeah, I, I, I saw this too, that for medicine to continue to like to, to help so many people that struggle with these, these things, it's like the doctor has to, doctors have to choose either they embrace it and they become healers and they learn this truly like in med school, right? Yeah. Or they say, no, we deal with like the physical and the rest, you know, goes somewhere else. And I think to be honest with you, this, this doctor becoming a healing, like it, 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 it would entail such a complemental, a complete fundamental restructuring of the entire system that I don't think is going to happen. But anyway, that's what I would think. And I wanted to ask you because you, you're actually trained as a doctor. And like, I, I don't even look at, like, I even look at it as how like doctors, one of the biggest things for me when I was in healthcare tech was how to leverage doctors time appropriately. And oftentimes doctors had this pressure from leadership about having shorter and shorter appointments. 15 minutes and, and, you know, utilizing doctors as much as possible. And I just don't see with that model, how this would work. I just, you need to spend more time. And so like, besides even just the, I just think the whole industry as a whole isn't built for this. Yeah, exactly. And it's so many levels. And you, you mentioned one, the session by session, like when I was working as a doctor and I saw somebody with insomnia, I'd be like, oh my gosh, okay. I, I do some teaching. I have 15 minutes. I do some really important teaching. And then I'm like, See you in two weeks because that's the short and that, and that was pretty fast, right? Two weeks is pretty fast for a doctor, like bye bye, and there's nothing. They're like completely on their own. That just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> so, I mean, there's so much more to talk about. I, I think uh, we'll have to finish up here, but I just want to say uh, it's been amazing. Super nice connecting with you and um, and uh, hope to hope to be in touch soon. Yeah, man. Thanks for reaching out. I, uh, I'm glad you did. And, uh, I'm glad we were able to connect, man. And uh, yeah, definitely again, I'll bring you my channel. It'll be dope. Give you that. <laughs> okay, bye now, Sean. Right, bye -bye. See you guys.